This is a download from BFM 89.9, the business station. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. I'm Mira Sivasudhi. We're discussing heart failure today. It's often the final stage of a heart disease, but is it all doom and gloom? We use the words heart failure, heart attack, cardiovascular um, disease, all interchangeably. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> What is a heart failure really? In the studio with me to help us understand and to, to explore the topic of living with heart failure is Dr. Dr. Azmi Muhammad Ghazi. He's a clinical director of the Heart Failure and Heart Transplant Centre at Institute Jantong Nagara. Welcome to the show, Dr. Azmi. How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you very much, Mira. So very quickly, can you give me the difference? What is a heart failure? What is a heart attack? What is a you know myocardial infarction? Is that what you call it? Yes, yeah? it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, what is the difference? Yeah, Heart failure, or more known as congestive heart failure, is the end results of any insult to the heart. So heart failure is defined as when the heart fails to function as a pump uh, to provide blood. So it's unable to provide blood to the rest of the body. Uh, to your organ, to our tissue. So, and a heart attack is something that when you had 100% occlusion of the coronary arteries, so that is a heart attack. And if the heart attack is not treated early, uh, then patients can have heart failure. So, hence, that's why we always emphasize early treatment for patients with heart attack. So, I, can you have a heart? Can you have heart failure if you haven't had a heart attack? Yes, you can, because there are other reasons. Because the main cause of uh, heart failure is coronary artery disease, and coronary artery disease this can present either with a heart attack or with a severe, for example, triple vessel disease. So you have a gradual blockage of the coronary arteries that leads to heart failure. But there's also other causes of heart failure, which includes congenital heart disease. So mm-hmm. somebody with, you know, born with a hole in the heart or somebody with actually, who are actually born with a dilated heart, what we call dilated cardiomyopathy. And some people can actually develop virus, for example, virus myocarditis that develops and leads to, to heart failure. And there's also other problems like biochemical problem, for example, hyperthyroid uh, or patients with arrhythmias that can actually, arrhythmias is something like atrial fibrillation, uh, irregular heartbeat can, that can actually lead to heart failure. Um, alcohol can also, uh, excessive alcohol can also cause um, uh, heart failure as well. Okay, yeah. and what's the most common cause of heart failure in Malaysia? In Malaysia and also in worldwide coronary artery disease, which is heart attack, is the most common in, uh, as cause of heart failure. Okay, and yeah. how do you break this this news to somebody who's experiencing heart failure? And does it mean that if you've had a heart attack, you have heart failure? Um, not necessarily, because some patients who had a heart attack, they they had early treatment and they had good treatment, and and their heart can be preserved. So they um, most of them end up with no heart failure. So it doesn't affect the blood flow. Not necessarily, because if you revascularize, meaning you treat it early, then you can actually preserve the heart muscle. Yeah. But to actually um, a diagnose heart failure is you need either um, you need to know the symptoms and signs, and also you need investigations. For example, like a blood test. Okay? We do have a specific blood test that we can actually look at heart failure, and also you need a diagnostic test, which is the echocardiogram, uh, which is the ultrasound of the heart to actually determine the actual function of the heart. Okay, and when is it considered heart failure? When your heart is performing at how much capacity? Yeah. The heart failure can be divided into two. Uh, one is what we call the systolic heart failure, which is the inability of the heart to pump. So this is when the ejection fraction of the heart, uh, which is less than 40%, yeah, normal is 50 to 60%. What does that mean? Which is the capacity of the heart to pump blood out of the heart. Uh, 50 to 60% is normal. And if you have less than 40%, it's actually defined as heart failure. There is also a condition whereby the heart is unable to relax. So that is actually, um, so there's a defect in terms of filling defect. So this is what we call heart, wave, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction which means that the heart function is within normal limits. So the ejection fraction of the heart function is about 50%. Yeah. But it is still heart failure? It is still heart failure. So they present in similar way in terms of their symptoms and signs and the treatment are rather similar, even though that we are not very sure or even in the worldwide, we're not sure how to treat heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but mainly we, we treat it similar to how we treat heart failure with systolic heart failure. So how do you tell patients that, you know, you know, you have to tell them that they're experiencing heart failure. What's that like? Yep. I mean, I'm sure there's psychos- um, psychological effects of that. 
not easy and is not being taught in medical school. Yeah. <laughs> so, a lot is yeah, not taught not, in medical so, school. So in a way, we have to learn by experience. And uh, the way is to, you know, to tell them that it's a chronic disease, uh, something like diabetes. You know, people are not, you know, a lot of people are not so scared of having diabetes. Yeah? But then when they hear heart failure, they feel scared. You know, but heart failure is a chronic disease and there is a potential treatment. And there is also a potential that the patients can become better. And if the heart failure is due, due to treatable disease, for example, arrhythmias or problems with virus, there might be a potential that the heart failure can recover. You know, so these are the things that is very important. So usually what we normally do is when we break uh, bad news like this, we have to ensure that they understand the diagnosis. They have to understand what are the treatment options and what is the prognosis, what is their outcome, potential outcome. And of course, you know, you probably will need a family support as well. How does it impact one's life? Could you give me an example? Yeah, somebody who has heart failure, it can be either mild heart failure or severe heart failure. There's a lot, there's a few categories or stages of heart failure. If the person has mild heart failure, maybe they can live normally. Yeah, they can they can they can do their normal activities at home without much of a problem. But of course, if the patient has severe heart failure, then they are unable to mobilize. They cannot walk. They are actually bed bound. So in a way, heart failure can cause a lot of problems and a lot of disability uh, to an individual which suffer from heart failure. And of course, it can cause a lot of problems to the family as well to support patients with heart failure. What's the percentage of people with heart attacks having heart failure in Malaysia? Do we know? Okay, there is no real data for that but usually patients who has heart attack, it comes up to about to about 30%, 30 to 40% will end up with heart failure. So these are some of the registries that we look into. So not all patients who have a heart attack have heart failure. Okay, yeah. um, and does it mean, and this is so disturbing, is it all doom and gloom though for the patient? No, because there's a lot of treatment options and I think people feel, okay, heart failure is the end of it as I mentioned, but it's not. Heart failure is a chronic disease like any other chronic diseases as I mentioned. High cholesterol is also a chronic disease, diabetes is a chronic disease and there is a potential for treatment and there's potential of reversibility, meaning that you can reverse heart failure in some conditions and depending on the cause. Of course, if the patient is actually born with uh, with a norm, abnormal heart, then it's unlikely to reverse that. But then if the patients develop heart failure yeah. during that age, there is a potential of reversibility. Okay, you can reverse it. You can. There is potential to reverse it. You know, I've yeah. always said um, people have problems taking statins, mm. Um, especially if you're in the high-risk group and all yeah. of that, and to prevent um, cardiovascular disease in mm. general, people are very reluctant um, for reasons, you know, best known to them. Um, but I always say when you have a heart attack, the damage that it does to your heart yes. um, sometimes is irreversible. Yeah. Could you just quickly explain to me yeah. what a heart attack can actually do yeah. to your heart? And, you know, it cannot, can it go back to functioning at full capacity as it did in the past? Okay. I think, first of all, the, one of the risk factors of developing coronary artery disease, which is atherosclerosis, um, and it's mainly due to a lipid fat depositions. So a narrowing of the artery is because of cholesterol, high cholesterol and fat. Um, and even if you have a narrowing of 50%, and it is irreversible, Okay, And of course, if a heart attack happens, which is a 100% occlusion of the coronary artery, it will you know, cause death of the muscle of our heart and the muscle will not be able to generate. If you have a muscle uh, um, degeneration outside your skeletal muscle, your body in your, in your bicep or your tricep, you can actually regenerate new muscles and the muscles are normal. But then if you damage your heart muscles, there is no cure. There is no uh, reversibility for that. Once it's damaged, it's damaged. And the damage due to uh, heart attack, uh, uh, myocardial infarction, is more damaging. It can cause scarring and the scarring can cause heart failure. And of course, the, the scarring can also lead to arrhythmias. Patients can develop VT and VF, for example, which is the cause of a sudden death in, 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 in patients like this. What is VT? Ventricular tachycardia and VF is ventricular fibrillation. So some patients, for example, if they have a poor heart function, uh, by definition less than 35% ejection fraction, left ventricular ejection fraction, um, and these patients will be a benefit to have an ICD, which is a pacemaker, a defibrillator. 
Yeah, so you know, it's the evidence is as strong as that. And usually, if patients who had an MI, they will have a lot of scarring, and these are the patients would benefit highly uh, with an ICD. So evidence are there. So patients who develop a heart attack, heart failure secondary to heart attack, it is more, mainly irreversible. So ideally, you just want to prevent it. Like, it is, yeah, yeah. You know, so I'm I'm not sure why because we uh, why are the concern because we participate in a lot of. Uh, studies with statins, we don't see what are the the issues about statins that has been brought up. Uh, mainly, we do no, no, notice that there's some problems with statins. For example, it can cause inflammation of the muscle. So some patients can have muscle pain, back pain, leg pains. But it's usually quite benign. When you stop it or you change it to a different class, it will resolve. Okay, so unless it's yeah. a, a congenital heart defect oh, yeah. or a, a dilated heart or a virus or hypothyroidism, um, you know, you have control... Yes. Over this heart attack. Yes. You can prevent it. Yeah. Um, we'll come back and find out more about lifestyle, lifestyle changes after a heart failure and mm-hmm. some of the things you need to do um, to manage it in order to lead a normal life as possible. Um, coming up next on The Bigger Picture, BFM 89.9. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. If you've just joined us, I am Mira Sivasudi in our Health and Living segment. We're discussing living with heart failure with Dato Dr. Azmi Mohamad Ghazi, Clinical Director of Heart Failure and Heart Transplant Centre in Institute Jantung Negara. Um, I think we've made the distinction that a heart failure is not a heart attack. It's um, when you know, the blood flow in your heart is actually affected. It is, in Malaysia, most often caused by a heart attack. We've spoken about other causes of heart failure. If you have a congenital heart disease, if you have atrial fibrillation, if you have a dilated heart, possibly a virus that causes something to go wrong, um, if you have a hypothyroid condition, then perhaps you may be predisposed to um, um, a heart failure. Having said that, it is not a heart attack. Um, Lifestyle changes are important when someone has experienced heart failure. What are some of those changes that need to be made? Yeah. Um, first of all, when I um, discuss about the management for heart failure, um, before I introduce medication, I will emphasize on lifestyle. Lifestyle, number one, is they cannot take too much water. Why? Okay? The reason is because um, the heart is impacted. They won't be able to cope with a high volume of blood if the patient has too much water. So they will accumulate water. So then they will have leg swelling, they will have um, abdominal distension. Uh, They can also get shortness of breath because of water retention. The other thing is salt. They so cannot, just yeah. hold on a second. Yeah. So the heart can't cope with the increased with the supply increase, of blood. So, yeah. so then the blood gets stored somewhere else. Yes, yes. As, exactly. And that's what you mean by fluid retention. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is um, they have to reduce salt intake. Yeah. So the reason is because salt can cause water retention and it can cause the same effect as what if you're drinking too much. And the other thing is we have to make sure that the patient weigh themselves every day. The reason why is because uh, fluctuations of weight every day okay, is not because of fat. It's not because of muscle. It's actually because of water. So if you want to prevent patients from having decompensation, acute decompensation, which means that they become very breathless, have to be admitted to the hospital, they have to ensure that their weight is stabilised. We normally have what we call a dry weight, so the ideal weight for the patient. So the target should be about a kilo or a kilo, plus or minus, within the dry weight. So that's why yeah. they say sometimes fluid retention is a symptom of heart heart disease? Yes, yes, it is, yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, of course, light exercise is important as well because light exercise, for example, you know, half an hour of cardio walking is good because it will improve the circulations, improve um, the the pumping of the heart and that can actually reduce or or actually cause heart failure to, you know, symptoms to, to improve. What about sleep apnea? Does that contribute? Okay, or? sleep apnea is, is something very interesting because you can have sleep apnea causes heart failure and you can have heart failure patients have sleep apnea. So in a way, it can be interrelated. So if you do have sleep apnea, so we need to, we, we start screening patients with heart failure for sleep apnea nowadays. So I will ask uh, our patients whether they have problems sleeping, whether they snore. Not everybody snores have sleep apnea, but whether they have problems concentrating during the day or whether they feel very tired during the day or they, if they sleep easily during the day, that's actually quite um, you know, an early sign of sleep apnea. And of course, if it's detected early, we, we would like to advise patients to go for a sleep study because that is the way to diagnose 
um, sleep apnea. And if sleep apnea is diagnosed, then the patients have to do some lifestyle intervention, for example, weight reduction, exercise, quit smoking, quit alcohol. And perhaps also at the same time, uh, they have to see an ENT to mm-hmm. see whether there's an obstruction in terms of the breathing. Uh, and if that all okay has been addressed, then they probably have to consider CPAM, which is a breathing, uh, a positive pressure breathing mm-hmm. to improve or to reduce their sleep apnea. That's a machine, isn't That's it? That's a machine that yeah. they actually sleep with. Traveling, Um, does having, when you have heart failure, does that impact traveling? Okay. Um, Traveling um, has no problem. I think, you know, when you go up in the, in the aeroplane, for example, the oxygen is contained. Um, I usually, patients with heart failure can travel. Of course, travel will, will cause water retention because sometimes you don't, you're not mobilized in the plane. You know, usually I will encourage them to walk all over when they're actually in the plane. And then when they arrive at the destination, they have to ensure that they still control their fluid balance. So traveling is not a problem. Okay. Patient. What about relationships? Does it affect, yeah. impair yeah. Um, yeah. relationships? Yeah, I think the relationships, yes, it can impair. Number one, it could be emotional stress uh, because of having the diagnosis itself. And number two, they can actually be having problems physically performing sexual activities. That is recognized. Uh, we do have um, um, counseling and in, in, our, in our subset of patients, we actually screen for patients and men especially with erectile dysfunction. What is the prognosis like? Um, what are the factors that will determine whether you live you know, a long and fruitful life? What's the life expectancy like? And the reason I ask you is because singer and actress Queen Latifah's mother, Rita Owens, she died after living with heart failure for 14 years. Mm. Would you say that's a yeah. good 14 years is a good time yeah. to, or you know, a relatively long time to be able to live after heart failure? Yeah. In terms of statistically, uh, 50% of patients who have been diagnosed of heart failure uh, will eventually succumb after five years. 15? 50, 50, 50, 50%. Yeah, so the prognosis of heart failure is not that great. The only Even thing if is, you do all the right things. Yes. Yeah. The only thing is, of course, you want to be in the 50% of patients who actually manage to survive more than five years. Mm-hmm. That's the idea. And the way to do that is because by lifestyle and also medical therapy. Because the medical therapy that we have is number one is to improve symptoms, to make them feel better. Because when you have heart failure, you feel tired, you feel breathless. With the medications that we give, something like diuretics, fruzamide mm-hmm. or bumetanide, they can actually offload Float the fluid retention, fluid. yeah. So and they feel better, but there are also a classification of medication that actually improves prognosis. So which means that it's a life-saving drugs that actually long lengthen uh, someone's life with the medication, which includes uh, a group of medications of ACE inhibitor or ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker. The latest one we have uh, is something that we call ARNI, which is angiotensin receptor niprilizin inhibitor called Entresto. Um, beta blockers is also used in patients with heart failure. Spironolactone or aplerinone is something used as well. So there are various class of medications that is proven to actually improve prognosis in this patient. So you want to lengthen this, their, their, their life you know, with combinations of this. And apart from medication, um, if the patient's still symptomatic, meaning they're still having problems with breathlessness, despite optimizing their medical therapy, the medicine that I mentioned earlier, then you can go for a pacemaker. Okay? There are two types of pacemaker. One is a CRT, which is cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, which synchronizes the function of the heart uh, and improves in terms of symptoms and prognosis. The other one is the defibrillator, which I mentioned earlier on, to actually prevention of a sudden cardiac death. Okay. And um, what about drug interactions? I mean, you've mentioned a lot of medication there. And with comorbidities, people coming in with diabetes and hypertension um, and trying to live with heart failure as well, I mean... Mm -hmm. Doesn't drug interaction pose a problem? Yeah, I do agree. But the only thing is that there's a lot of uh, uh, drugs available. Um, The common ones are common. Uh, Most of the medications that we use are the bread and butter medications that we use as a cardiologist in treatment of heart failure. And and majority of our heart failure patients will have comorbidities like um, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. So some of these drugs can be used 
together. So you can use um, insulin, for example, or you can use metformin, for example, treatment for diabetes, together with the ACE inhibitor and beta blockers that we use. Of course, there are common side effects, for example, a cough if they use a certain type of medications, but then we can change it to another because there are various types, various different class of medication that we can actually use for this type of patients. What's the role of cardiac rehabilitation? Very, very important. And what is it? Very, very important. Basically, cardiac rehabilitation is you combine uh, a physical exercise but also healthy lifestyle, so encouragement. So these type of patients will go through a physiotherapist, they will go through an exercise regime, they will teach how to exercise based on their heart capacity and also they will be motivated in that way as well because you have to understand that some of the heart failure patients will have limitations in terms of what they can do so by going through a cardiac rehabilitation they will be able to know what is their extent of capability of doing things and is very very important you know, you mentioned the pacemaker as sort of like the gold standard, but there's mm. also um, a heart transplant possibility. Mm. I mean, you had the transplant centre at Institute Gentle Nagara. Um, have do we do many heart transplants for heart failure? Yeah, um, ultimately, if someone suffers from heart failure, the gold standard, the best treatment is to have a heart transplant. But of course, it's not easy as what we say because once that person has a heart transplant, uh, they will have to be with us forever because they have to take a, a medication throughout their life as immunosuppression to be to as an anti-rejection. They have to have biopsy. For example, we have to take pieces of their heart within a year, maybe about 12 pieces, 12 times in a year to, to see whether there's any signs of rejection. And there are also complications from the immunosuppressive drugs, for example, cancer. You know, some patients can develop cancer with the immunosuppression drugs. So it's not the end. You know? So it's actually what I tell my patients who had heart transplant. It's the beginning. And please like us. Please like me. Please like, you know, the heart failure coordinators because we will be together, you know, th- you know for many, many years. So we have been very successful uh, in IGN that we run a heart transplant program uh, with the cardiologists and also the cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, we recently we have celebrated um, the longest living uh, patient who had a heart transplant almost more than 20 years and um, and the most recent heart transplant that we had in IGN uh, was recently in March this year uh, and she has successfully underwent a heart transplant doing really well and she's back to work okay yeah all right yeah. there's just one um, but you don't want to go down that route now do you if you, unless you have no okay, choice. Yeah, and course, what about donors? It's hard to get course, donors. Yeah, right? because basically, uh, you know, we will not consider anybody for heart transplant unless if their lifestyle changes, their medical therapy, and also the device fails. And that's the only one that we, in this type of patients, and in fact, we have to really choose the patient. If they have multi-organ failure, for example, they have kidney problems together with liver problems, they won't be suitable for heart transplant. So the selection process is very, very tedious. When you say device face, uh, fails, meaning the pacemaker fails? The fails, yeah. So okay. in a way, they don't respond. So not fail, but they don't respond with the device. Yeah. So, so there's a very tight monitoring. Yes, yes, yeah, you... it is. And, and to get a donor is not easy as well. Yeah. And, and what, are, I... what are some of your challenges of um, with patients um, with heart failure? Um, what's the biggest challenge getting them to lead a normal life? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can give them all the medications yeah. in the world and yeah. do the cardiac rehab, um, um, but yeah. what are some of your challenges? The, the, the most challenges for us is, is mental, I think, is the compliance to the medication and to the lifestyle. And number two is depression. Uh, we noticed that about 20% of our patients with heart failure will have be, will be in clinical depression. So they have a diagnosis of depression. So that needs requires treatment. You know, hence, I think we need to detect early. We have to give them counselling. Uh, we have to support them. Uh, and some patients will require medication for depression. Do we have proper guidelines in Malaysia to manage heart disease? And the reason I ask you is because um, only a few days ago, the British Medical Journal published an updated National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. We know, um, Mm. NICE, right? Um, It's a guidance for chronic heart failure in adults based on further evidence on novel and existing therapies. Now, this is for the UK. Do we have properly spelt out guidelines here in Malaysia? Uh, Yes, we do, actually. It's under the wing of the National Heart Association of Malaysia. 
we have what we call the CPG, Clinical Practice Guideline uh, in Management of Heart Failure. Uh, the last um, um, review was in 2014 and we are currently reviewing it and hopefully we can publish the update, updated version at the end of this year or early next year. And, M1, and I am one of the, the participants for the, for, the, for the updates. And yes, there is a guideline in Malaysia. That is the Malaysian guidelines, but usually in each institution or hospitals, they will also have their own guidelines, adapted guidelines. In IGN, we have a guideline for patients who are admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. So somebody who comes in with heart failure that requires treatment in IGN, we have a standard protocol. We have a, a something that they will follow everybody so that we streamline so that we can ensure that every patient who comes into the hospital with heart failure will receive medication and treatment and investigations the same if they are treated by a heart failure specialist or another cardiologist you know, which is not a heart failure specialist. Okay. Um, recently, so there was a news report about a large clinical trial, something called the Metra Clip. Um, it is uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's used to repair damaged heart valves. What's this clip? Yeah, that's Better very, than the pacemaker? Very, very interesting. <laughs> um, it's actually an add-on therapy, so it's not a replacement. Yeah. So because basically what happened is in in the heart, which has which which is heart failure, the the heart is enlarged, so the the valves becomes leaking. So it's actually leaking mitral valve. So um, okay, let's talk about the valve. The valve yeah. is actually managing the flow from van, one ventricle to the other? Yes, it's just yeah. like a door. So the yeah. door will open and close. Yeah. And when the heart enlarges, the door becomes more separated and it becomes leaking. So, and conventionally, this type of patients will require just normal medication uh, to, to reduce the size of the heart. But some patients will not be able to reduce the size of the heart. Surgery will be very, very uh, high risk for this group of patients, for example, to repair or replace the valve. So now there's a technique of what we call mitral clip. And it's been tested for patients with heart failure. And recently, as you mentioned, um, the article is very, very interesting. It's published recently. And they actually look at almost 900 or you know, 600 patients that they actually uh, went through a mitral clip or re- uh, a clipping of the mitral valve and also a op- uh, standard medical therapy. And they actually found that patients feel better their prognosis is better, but the follow-up is only six months. So I think we we need to see a longer follow-up, at least up to about one year or three years, in terms of their prognosis and survival benefit. What does this clip this. actually do? The clip is actually to um, reduce the size of the leaking. Where do you put the clip? In the valves. So that requires operation? Uh, It's actually um, something like when we perform a coronary angioplasty. So it's a minimal invasive. It doesn't require an open heart surgery. In fact, in Malaysia, we have done it. In IGN, we've done mitral clips. But the mitral clips that we did is actually not for functional MR, not for patients with heart failure specifically. It's actually mainly because if somebody has a mitral valve prolapse, so the the structure of the valve is abnormal, Mm -hmm. but they are not fit enough to go for surgery conventional surgery. We have done. So IGN has that program, but we don't do it routinely for patients with heart failure. Do you think um, this is good news that you probably may? Yes, yeah. It's I'm very actually, promising then. Yeah, I'm actually very, very excited with this and I think it brings uh, in another dimension or another in a step up of therapy. I wouldn't say this is a replacement of a therapy. I think this is an add-on mm-hmm. of therapy. Because yeah. it's a valve. Yes, it's Fantastic. A valve. I mean, yeah. there's a Cochrane review um, in 2016 that found low quality evidence that bone marrow derived stem cells therapy may actually help. What's your take on bone marrow yeah. stem cells? Yeah, stem cells very very interesting, very close to our heart as well because you know we you know we partic- a lot not proven though. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, we have tested. We actually uh, have done some clinical trials before many many years ago uh, under our surgical our surgeon cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, but um, but then yes, it is uh, unproven. It's still an investigation. Um, and in fact, um, uh, currently there's a discussion within the cardiologists uh, to actually um, to embark into a stem cell therapy in Malaysia. And I think we will see how it goes in the future. Okay, yeah. so um, you're going to do it on your own then? Yes, yeah. Okay. so we're thinking of that. And, and it is the, the stem cell um, uh, research that we're embarking is a multi-centre, including IGN, the Ministry of Health Hospitals and also the University Hospitals as well. Just run it by me. What, do, what will the stem cells do? 
to help with heart failure? Basically, the stem cells is to try to regenerate new cells. Right. Because, as I mentioned earlier, the heart will not be able to generate. Once it's, it's, it's damaged. damaged, it's still damaged. Mm-hmm. It won't be able to. So the stem cells is to try and regenerate better cells, cells that are actually functioning similar to our myocytes. So that's the idea. To build new myocytes. Yeah. To regenerate, regenerate muscle. muscles, yeah. But then, of course, the property of the muscles that we regenerate has to be the same quality yep. of the the heart muscles, and at the same time, it cannot be something that can cause problems. For example, scar tissue and stuff. So there's a lot, a, a lot of it. How yeah. exciting! Are you hiring? It is. <laughs> <laughs> this is such exciting stuff. Um, stages of heart failure. Mm. What do we expect yeah. in order to manage it properly? Yeah. Um, in terms of stages of heart failure, you can have mild, moderate or severe. Okay, There's a lot of other classifications from the medical point of view based on functional class. For example, New York, uh, New York uh, classifications of 1, 2, 3 and 4. But to keep it simple is mild, moderate or severe. Mild, you can do your normal activities and severe, you're actually bed bound basically. And there will be, it's a chronic disease, there will be a progression. Okay? So somebody with a mild heart failure diagnosed will eventually go through a severe heart failure at some point. The idea of therapy is to prolong this, to try to try and delay the progression from mild to severe heart failure. You know, um, as you mentioned earlier, the prognosis is um, 50% um, only of heart failure patients will live up to five years yes. and the remainder 50% will live more mm-hmm. than five years. So mm-hmm. that means end stages of heart failure is inevitable. Yes. Um, how do you manage that? Okay. What does that entail for the patient? Does it mean end of life care? You know, yeah, yeah. what happens? Not, not easy because there are, there are few ways where patients with heart failure can eventually succumb. Number one is pump failure. So which means that their heart becomes very weak and weak. They become very breathless and they're, re- and they're bed bound and they require medication to support their heart. The other uh, way is where they become, they collapse, they have a sudden death. So these are the two most common cause or way of people presented yeah, and with heart failure to, to uh, in a way when they succumb. So um, in terms of end of life care, we, you know, we are, you know, we, of, of course, in, in heart failure, we have to discuss with the patient. And um, the the types of patients that we discuss for end of life care is mainly if the patients develop multi organ failure. So if they have heart failure, and then leading to renal failure, re- leading to liver failure. So in a way, they are not going to respond with medical therapy. They're not respond to a device, a pacemaker, and they won't be a suitable transplant candidate. So these are the people that we think we will explore the options of animal life care. But we are not end of life care specialists, so usually we will we will work together with our palliative care colleagues um, that actually comes in and, and and ensure that all this good care is delivered. Please don't think end of life care is is not like a, a we don't stop looking after them. We actually continue looking after them, and in fact, we actually look after them. Even better, yeah. yeah, because you know we know that they're terminal. There's yeah. a lot of misconceptions about yes, end of yeah, life care. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean you're going there to die. Yes, yeah. um, it's it's to ensure comfortable, mm-hmm. you know, end mm-hmm. of life. Actually, um, you, how important is family support when you are diagnosed with heart failure? Very, very important. Yeah, or just support in general. Yeah, yeah, is is very important because basically when you someone's admitted to the hospital, they can be they have the nurses, the doctors, the physio, the dietitian, and everybody um, pays attention to the patient and the family. But when they actually go home, that's when the problem starts. The patients will feel depressed. They don't know what to do, and they don't know where to get help. So, because we are a hospital-based um, um, healthcare, so what we want to do now is our initiative for this year is actually to provide care at home when the patient's discharged. So, we in IGN, we are actually creating uh, what we call the heart failure support group. Um, and this support group includes cardiologists, um, the doctors, the nurses, the physiotherapists, our counsellor, dietitian, and all of us link together and to give support of patients at home. So if, for example, patients are discharged, they're at home, they have problems with 
uh, water retention, breathlessness. They have problems with, for example, how to control their blood pressure, how to, to tolerate medications, side effect medications. They can ring us. And one of our heart failure counsellor will be able to advise. And if the heart failure counsellor will not be able to advise, then they will speak to a specific uh, subspecialty, for example, a doctor or, or a, a pharmacist if it's regarding medication. And uh, we're also looking for volunteers as well. And I think we also want public volunteers to be in our organisations because we realise that there is no support group for heart failure existing in Malaysia. Everywhere in the world there is. So we will give them education, we will give them medical support, we will give them emotional support. And in the future, hopefully, we can give them financial support in cases where treatment, because some of the heart failure treatments are very expensive and is not, you know, some patients cannot afford expensive treatment. As depression, yeah. you said, is a big yes, yeah. problem as well. Yeah, depression, you know, so because when they go home, you know, no one else in the family or friends knows what they're experiencing because no one else knows about heart failure. And uh, depression is very common and some patients will need treatment for depression. Okay, your yeah. message on heart failure. Yeah. First of all, I think you know heart failure is you know is a chronic disease. Uh, it is uh, we need to detect early. The reason why is because one is detected early, we can actually treat them. There are various and uh, medications that can actually improve survival and also improve prognosis of patients like this. And we want to make sure that the patients feels better. They can actually live longer. And there are a lot of new medications available. You just have to explore that. And there is also future investigational therapies that is available and currently ongoing. Yeah. So in a way, it's not a doom and gloom. You know, it is something you know exciting that we're looking forward to. And now there's support. Yes, yes. And I think the support is something that we feel very strongly about. And I think this is one of IGN initiatives for this year to actually improve our care for patients with heart failure. So if you're interested to volunteer, how do we do that? Please contact IGN. We will, you know, we will launch the heart support group uh, in in October, uh, and I think there will be an event in IGN for the heart failure support group. And I think, you know, it will be in our website, in IGN website as well. Fantastic. For, yeah. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. That was Dr. Azmi Muhammad Ghazi, clinical director of Heart Failure and Heart Transplant Centre in IGN, speaking to us about living with heart failure on the Bigger Picture BFM eighty nine point nine. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To find more great interviews, go to bfm.my or find us on iTunes. BFM 89.9, The Business Station.